Welcome to the Hunting Illinois podcast. Uh, with us today, we got uh, everybody here, actually, for the first time in a while. So it's Jason, Adam, Curtis, and Dan. And today we're going to be talking about uh, some out-of-state opportunities that we've probably taken before and some some affordable opportunities that we've kind of taken and taken advantage of in the past. So that's kind of what we're talking about here today. We're in the summer months here, and it kind of gets us daydreaming about uh, all the fun we've had while we sit here and wait for, for hunting seasons to come about. So with that, um, let's just get talking about it, guys. So who's been out of state and done something really cool, and they want to talk about it? Well, first off, I just want to, like, encourage people to, to not be shy about looking out of state for hunting and fishing opportunities because – It is more expensive, obviously, when you have to buy the non-resident licenses, but if you're not going for big game like deer, uh, for a lot of these states, it's really pretty affordable, and there's a lot of options, and and it just opens up a new adventure for you. And for me, that's what hunting's all about, is pushing myself to get outside and have adventures. So right now in the off-season, this is a great time to look around and see uh, what sort of adventures you can start planning for the fall or even next spring. So... Um, yeah, this is a great time to think about this stuff. So this, this is definitely going to get me excited talking about it here today. Did you want to jump into your stuff <laughs> right away? or what? Oh, no, sure. Yeah, right. yeah. So, yeah, first thing I think we should talk about is something that we all just recently did. Well, all except for Adam. You were flying. Sorry, Adam. But uh, for the rest of us, we, we uh, kind of got chased off the river due to lightning, but we took a little trout fishing trip to southern missouri lake tanny como here recently and uh that's definitely a trip that should be on people's radar because not only is it a productive trip where you can go and probably get your possession limit of trout uh to come back and and uh and eat but it's a beautiful lake absolutely beautiful clear lake uh there were places where it was 14 feet deep and i felt like we could see the bottom you know just absolutely gorgeous And it's right in Branson. So when you get done fishing, if you want to go catch a show or eat some good food, or I I do happen to know they have some of the world's best cobbler. Uh, There's (laughs) there's some of those little restaurants in Branson. I mean, holy cow. Yeah, they, some of them, them older ladies in southern Missouri, they know how to make some cobbler. (laughs) That's worth a trip alone right there. And I got to be honest, I mean, Curtis, like, we, he brought it up that he knew this existed here and we went over there. But uh, this, I've been to Gatlinburg before in Tennessee, and uh, I've also been to New Jersey Shore and stuff. And I, I, the first time I went to Gatlinburg, I was actually unpleasantly surprised at the, at the touristness of it all because I've been, I, I grew up in the East Coast, so I go to Jersey Shore all the time. And it looked like the Jersey boardwalk just vomited on the Smoky Mountains. <laughs> like, I was just going there to, like, go camping and, it, like, be in the outdoors. Like, I was thinking it would be, like, a Yellowstone-type thing, but it was not. It was, like, a Jersey Shore-type thing, which is a different vibe. Which, I mean, if you have fun there, that's awesome. If you have a family, that's awesome. But as a young guy going out trying to go hiking and stuff, I was like, oh, man, like, okay, cool. We're able to believe it or not, that's that's sweet. <laughs> um, but uh, but then when he's like, let's go to Branson, and I'm like, Branson, all, all right. And it just sounded like Gatlinburg, too, you know? But, uh, but no, man, this, like he said, that river, or I call it a river, it is a lake, it's a dammed up river, but uh, it is so clear, we were there, we talked about this last podcast, it was a flood, and it was still clear water, I can only imagine what it's like being there when uh, it is not flooded, because I mean, it was six feet above flood stage, I mean, it was, it was roaring, and uh, we're sitting there driving around, and he's catching a fish, and I can see it eight feet from the boat as he's reeling it in, I mean, it was insane. And the, the trout fishing is world class there too. I mean, it's uh, you don't have to go. I, I mean, there's nothing wrong with going out to Idaho or in the mountains and fishing on those streams. That's awesome. But you're not going to do it for the price that you can go to Southern Missouri and fish. I mean, we're talking about non-resident annual fishing license is forty nine bucks for the whole year. And Missouri actually has a daily non-resident fishing license. It's only eight bucks mm-hmm. a day. And so you do need the trout stamp if you're if you're fishing and going to keep trout, which is another ten bucks. But if you go down for just a couple days, you're talking about eight dollars a day, sixteen dollars for two days plus a trout stamp. I mean, you can do for the licenses you need just to fish less than thirty bucks to go down there and uh, 
and do that. So pretty crazy. Yeah, and it's a it's a really cool part of the the, the country. I mean, I'm obviously a little biased. I grew up in Missouri, as did Curtis. And you know, even if if you look outside of Lake Taney Como, you have Bull Shoals Lake there, you have Table Rock Lake there, you have the Missouri Ozarks, and you just have a lot of these really cool natural features and natural waterways that really provide some excellent recreation type activities. So it's definitely a spot to to check out. Amazing. Next time you guys go, I'm gonna have to make it make it with. Oh yeah, I mean we we literally fished for you know 30, 45 minutes before the the storm really pushed us off the water, and we had just started we to catch fish. fish. We were into the <laughs> fish, man. We we were just Dan and I doubled up, and then boom, we had to leave. Yeah, I think we were just about to to really slam. I think so. And, I, and you got to check out Lily's Landing. Lily's yeah. Landing, holy cow, like. Oh my gosh, you talk about going above and beyond to tell you where the fish are, how to have a good time. Man, those people, the people that work at Lily's Landing, they really enjoy what they do and they're going to make sure you have a good time. So you got to stop in and talk to them. Yeah, I mean, you know, we stopped in with with, you know, a, a little we put in some effort doing some research on the on the watershed and kind of, you know, what the fishing report says. And they told us exactly what to buy, what what lures to use. Mm-hmm. You know, they even we even bought them out so they had to go back in the, the back room <laughs> grab out some more crankbaits for us. But they were good, just really spot prices. on. Great prices. Good prices. Yeah. And the guy walked, I mean, he got out from behind the counter and walked over to the lure and said, yes. buy this lure. Yes. And then we're like, okay. And he said, go catch fish on yeah. that lure. He's like, this is, like, the conditions we have today is why we purchased this lure. You should take this lure out. And then within... A half hour. I mean, I got shafted the most <laughs> because I had it. I had a, I drove the boat up river. So then you guys are tying on your lures. Why I still have my lures on from bass fishing or something. Right. So you guys are sitting there tying up, and then I drive up river, and then I, I as soon as I turn the boat off, uh, I start tying my line on. You guys start fishing. And then by the time I get that dang fishing knot to work <laughs> and do the old loop to loop and through. Uh, I look up and I see a black cloud above us, and I'm like, "So what's the safety plan when we hear a thunder? When we hear thunder, I hear guys like, do we pull into a dock by by us here, or do we just go? Like, what are we gonna do?" And then Curtis is like, "I think we're gonna be done at that point." And I'm like, "Cool." So then I first cast. I'm not. I'm not making this up. First cast, throw my line out, and as soon as my lure hits the water, I hear. Bah, 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 bah. I'm like, "Oh, well, there's the thunder," <laughs> and then uh, we were like, "All right, well, we'll keep fishing until it gets a little closer." And then we like literally 20 minutes, and it was yeah. on us. Yeah. And then we drove the boat back in a drizzle, and uh, and they literally had you know what five inches of rain the week before, so that yeah. water was moving. It was. And it, moving. it really was unsafe to be out there. And, you know, we thought about staying the night and maybe trying again the next day, but with the amount of rain they got, that water was just going to be just so high and, and so fast. But definitely yeah. a spot to check. Yeah, they asked us if we were going to come back tomorrow. And we're like, yeah. ah, the weather is not looking great, guys. So no, we're good. So then, but I mean, how how far would drive is from Central Illinois? I mean, five hours from Champaign ish. Yeah, ish. Yeah, it was that ain't far at all, man. Yeah. yeah, not too bad. And I mean, yeah, talk about a family trip. Even if you got members of your family that do not like uh, fishing at all, or even don't know? like the outdoors. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it's it's Branson. So yeah. I mean, it's like ditch, uh, ditch it's them like, in town. <laughs> Man, Vegas, basically. Yeah. Take them to a Dolly Parton show yeah. and drop yep. them off at the yeah. shops. See a magic and show. Yeah. Silver Dollar City. Go grab a boat. Yep. Yeah, but the food the food in the area was really good. Oh, yeah. I'll tell you. Oh, they have some great really food. Good. Yeah. So it didn't disappoint. Curtis was right. I'll give him that. So that was a fun trip. What other trips you guys hear about? Yeah, I'll talk a little bit about, you know, I, I obviously went to, to college in Kentucky, so I have a, quite a bit of experience hunting in Kentucky. And Kentucky has... A really unique archery season, especially in kind of these these Midwestern states, right? There's very few seasons where you get the opportunity to harvest a buck that is still in that summer velvet. Um, Kentucky is one of those states that, that you have that opportunity. Their archery season, um, last year it opened September 4th. I haven't checked the exact date, but I would imagine it's around the same time. Uh, for this upcoming year so it's a a really unique opportunity to you know get out try to harvest some early season deer way before you know illinois archery season even starts and so it's a it's a great opportunity and one hunt that i would really recommend people look into is um, in an area called land between the lakes it's a national forest or national recreation area is actually uh, how it's classified but it's about one hundred seventy thousand acres and it's this land between the lakes. You have Kentucky Lake on one side, and you have Lake Barkley on the other, and it's basically just a giant peninsula of 170,000 acres that, that you can essentially hunt and fish your face off. So uh, definitely something to, to look into. And the, the cool thing is land between the lakes actually spans 
Kentucky and Tennessee. So depending on which part of the park you're actually hunting, you could be hunting Kentucky um, regulations and Kentucky deer, or you could be hunting, you know, Tennessee deer in, in, in Tennessee. So it's a, a pretty cool spot. And there's, like I said, a, a ton of fishing opportunities in the area. That's awesome. nice. One but, quick question. Like if you do harvest a nice buck in velvet, uh, I've heard that taxidermists can preserve that mm-hmm. somehow. Do you know how do they do that? I think in a lot of cases there's a, a drying process, and then it's almost like a, a polyethylene type kind of clear coat that they oh, yeah. that they apply to the outside. Mm-hmm. Now I know in some cases if you harvest one that's starting to shed, they'll actually just go ahead and remove the velvet completely, and then apply some kind of artificial velvet to the antlers if if that's your your choice. Yeah, yeah. Because if you want to get it officially scored, you have to remove the correct, velvet, right? correct. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And some states, I like, I'm pretty sure Wisconsin has. Uh, uh, you are not allowed to harvest a buck in velvet. Mm. I believe I'd have to look into that for sure. But yeah, it's some. It's one of those things. Uh, I guess law enforcement uses it to try to pick people who maybe poach a deer early sure. and then wait until in the summer to yeah. claim it or something. I don't know, but yeah, I always thought that was weird because what if you, what if a buck kept its velvet on late and you? Yeah, shot? I don't know. Yeah. But kind of expanding on, on land between the lakes, you know, obviously the, the area is chock full of, of deer, of, you know, squirrel, rabbits, basically everything, uh, you know, a, a typical Midwesterner would, would expect in, in some kind of, you know, big style property. But the cool thing is they actually do have a, a fairly sizable elk herd. Um, it is a, a fenced in elk herd. Obviously, you know, Kentucky has, has reintroduced elk into the eastern portion of the state and they do have some some hunting opportunities there. Um, obviously, these are, are caged elk, but it, it's still pretty special to be in your deer tree stand. And even though it's, you know, a quarter, half mile away, still hear that bugle of an elk while you're sitting in your tree stand. There's just something ethereal and kind of special about that. But definitely a cool spot. both uh, Missouri and Wisconsin got their elk from Kentucky. So Kentucky's not only got an elk herd for themselves but they're basically supplying, supplying yeah. the yeah. rest of the midwest whoever wants elk yeah with elk. it's pretty, pretty cool. cool it is cool anybody needs some elk i guess <laughs> kentucky's <laughs> trading them out and the, the cool thing about land between the lakes is is they have a, a lot of areas that are very actively managed again it, it, it is a federal property um, so they do have a lot of crop sharing going on there's a lot of ag um, inside of, of land between the lakes that that does offer you know some food plots and it's it's a real special place to drive around and, and look at the soybean fields as you approach kind of late August and just watch all those bachelor groups of bucks out there it's it's pretty special um, cool place now the unfortunate part is land between the lakes um, is is kind of they have their own you know requirements like as most sites do and so their specific season doesn't start a little bit later in September uh, but again if, if you're trying to get down there and, and harvest some of these in in velvet bucks um, you can certainly find some some public land that it's open and, and get out on Better bring your thermos out <laughs> yeah. Yes. yeah man uh, so the one I would like to talk about is it's not in the fall, unfortunately. It's actually probably just past and or currently happening. And that's going to be smallmouth bass fishing in northern Michigan. And it's going to be at Wilderness State Park. And it's going to be on the Michigan side of the tip of the mitt. And it's where the kind of the archipelago comes off at, at the top of the Michigan there. And it's a really, really beautiful place. I mean, when you're walking out to the shoreline, it looks like you're walking through a tundra or Alaska or something like that. And then when you get to the water, it's as if you're in the Caribbean or something like that. No I mean, the, the water is crystal clear wow. and turquoise blue. And it's a really interesting situation because they used to test bombs there. So there's all these little potholes that are bombed craters from oh. back before World War II. And um, so it has all these little pools. And you, you, you wear waders and you go around and you can cast into these pools. And in late May, early June is when the smallmouth are there and they're spawning. So you can go up there and you can see schools of hundreds of smallmouth at any given time. I mean, you see shadows moving in the water, and it was extraordinary. I went up there with a fisheries biologist from Michigan one time, and he's like, listen, we're a little early, but we're going to go out. So it's still a pretty spot. We'll go walking out. And he's like, if you guys come back here in like a week or two, the the smallmouth should be in. And this guy apparently is recognizable from the bank because when we showed up, um, we're about a couple hundred yards away from us, we saw a little silhouettes of people shoulder to shoulder casting into this one spot and one guy turns and he yells randy randy's the biologist's name he's like randy they're here they're here randy they're here and uh, and then randy randy went from talking to us to not saying a word to us the rest of the day randy was in the zone 
I, I sat in the same pool as these guys. I mean, you can see the difference in skill. I caught seven fish that day, and, I mean, all of them, some of the biggest smallmouths I've ever caught. I mean, they're all just these giant smallmouth. I mean. Just footballs. Randy caught 40 fish. <laughs> <laughs> I sat there. I caught seven. Randy got 40. And I was happy with the seven that I had. But we were using these, like, kind of like these tube jigs. They look kind of like a round goby. They look like a mottled, mottled brown, mottled green color. And we just kind of jig them across the bottom. But if you can get up there in late May, it is, again, we always say it was world-class trout fishing down in Missouri. It is world-class, world, world-class smallmouth bass fishing in northern Michigan late May. And it is just a beautiful, beautiful spot. Um, I want to go back there. I haven't made it back in 10 years. i got to get back up there. Um, I don't know what we're doing. we got to get in the car right now, yeah. <laughs> and we'll take this podcast on the road. But uh, anyway, so that that's the spot. I mean, fishing licenses, like we said, there's daily fishing licenses, a couple, like, three-day fishing licenses, things like that in different states. I don't know what they have in Michigan right now, but um, it's pretty inexpensive and a beautiful, awesome location. I mean, it's like fishing. It's compared to bone fishing. Like, if you go to the Caribbean, you kind of do, like, the sport fishing in the flats. Mm-hmm. Same stuff. You're just going out of small mouth wow. in, in Lake Michigan. Mm-hmm. So... Awesome spot. That sounds great. Mm-hmm. Need to do that. Well, while we're talking about fishing, we got to throw out just one saltwater uh, trip here. And when I was in college, I used to go to Florida every year. I had a buddy who was in the Navy and had a boat down there, so it was super cheap. But um, the the fishing on the Gulf side of Florida is absolutely amazing. And if you have any contacts down there with a boat. Uh, definitely hit them up, smooch them up, send them a happy birthday card or something and try to get in good with them because uh, the the licenses are pretty cheap. For a non-resident Florida offshore annual license for the whole year, 47 bucks. 47 bucks. That's about how much you would spend for like a five pound grouper if you went to a grocery store around here. And Florida actually has a three-day and a seven-day non-resident license available. So you can get a three-day for 17 bucks, a seven-day for 30 bucks. I mean, it's, it's insane. When I was in college, I used to go down there, and even considering gas, which, of course, it was much cheaper than it is now, but even considering gas and everything, if you added up the amount of fish I brought back, I made money on my trips to Florida deep sea fishing, and all you have to do is find a wreck, go in the Gulf, find a wreck, and drop down some baits, and you're going to catch snapper and grouper. You don't have to be a good fisherman. You don't have to be patient. You don't have to be none of those things. It was some of the easiest fishing I've ever done in my whole life, but uh, really inexpensive, really fun, and different, and, and puts you into snapper. We caught red snapper, lane snapper, a couple different types of grouper, you can catch cobia, a ton of different kinds of fish. And if you troll around, you can catch the, the mackerel and, and stuff too, and the mahi-mahi and the fish that move around. So a really cool place to do some deep sea fishing, really inexpensive, and really not that far of a drive. I mean, the Gulf, I think you can get there in about 10 or 12 hours from most of Illinois. Mm-hmm. So uh, a day's drive, you can be down there. Um, and for 30 bucks, get a week's long um, offshore fishing license. So if you have a buddy down there with a boat, wow, yeah. Uh, what, what are you doing? Give yeah. us a call. <laughs> exactly. we'll, we'll come down with you. <laughs> and I know I've gone out with charters too. I mean, if you're interested and you've just never gone deep sea fishing before and you want to try it out, uh, I mean, you can go down to the Gulf or, or Florida or even I, I've lived up, again, Jersey. But uh, Jersey, I mean, you, you rent a boat. I mean, you're looking at a, several hundred dollars to get a, a private boat. But a party boat, you're looking at under 100 bucks, and you can get out and get on some fish and, and still come home with, with a limit or at least a cooler full, whatever, paying on whatever you're going out for. So, I mean, I, if you go out over to Jersey, you get stripers, and then, uh, I mean, down in, like you said, down in the Gulf, I mean, you can get all kinds of stuff. So uh, it's definitely worth the trip. If, you, if you've ever thought about doing it, it's really not the, as expensive as you might think it is if you go on a cheap I mean, you can figure out a way to get get out in the water somehow. Heck yeah. That reminds me, this past winter, we found some, a uh, couple buddies and I found some cheap flights down to Florida. So we went fly fishing for three days out, um, out of uh, Marco Island. Luckily, we had somewhere to stay. 
But again, I think that the flights were like sixty bucks, and then yeah. again, the three day license was like seventeen bucks. So we just paid for food and. I was so flights. happy you did that because yeah. I, I was I was looking around at flights down in Florida, and you're getting like you said it was like sixty dollars, and yeah. I was like just joking. I'm like, hey man, sixty bucks to Fort Lauderdale, and we were like going to Florida, and then Adam texted back, I just bought tickets, and I'm like, that's <laughs> awesome. Yeah, that was pretty fun, uh, especially because it was spur of the moment, and again, pretty cheap. Obviously, we got lucky with the flights. Um, and we didn't need a boat. We just fished off the shore and uh, kind of waited till the tide went down. But that was a really good, really good time. Yeah, man. Opportunities are out there. I mean, you just got to look around and then it's, it's, uh, capitalize on situations like the when the flights were really cheap this past yeah. couple of years. But I was just happy that it was, I think, like negative 10 degrees here that weekend. And it was, you know, like 60 something in Florida. So that I didn't care if we caught anything. I was just happy to be out of the cold. But mm-hmm. We ended up catching a few fish, so it was pretty fun. Yeah, you so. get to January, February in Illinois. I mean, how much arm twisting do you really got to do to get <laughs> yeah. somebody to want to go to Florida yeah. <laughs> for a few yeah. days, catch some fish, maybe have a, a fire down on the beach? I mm-hmm. mean, man, what's not to love? Mm-hmm. Any of you guys ever been down to Real Foot Lake down in, in kind of t- Kentucky, Tennessee area? Driven past it. Never have been able to be there, though. So that, that that's kind of a, a really cool spot with – just multiple different activities that, that you can really participate in. It's kind of world-renowned for several different things. Uh, the biggest one that most people think of when they think of Real Foot Lake is going to be waterfowl. It's it's definitely one of the, the most prolific and kind of, I want to say, renowned uh, public areas, especially along the Mississippi Flyway. It, it's, it's really just hands down one of the, the best. It's also got some of the best crappie fishing you'll find pretty much any, anywhere in, the, in this country. It's, it's got a ton of crappie, a ton of big crappie. And a lot of that is just due to, you know, the, the nature of how that, that lake was formed. Um, it's, a, it's a fairly old lake, kind of the, the mid-1800s is when it was established, but it's essentially a flooded bald cypress forest. And so you have these really cool areas that are, you know, five to ten feet deep that just have these bald cypress knees. And if you've never seen a bald cypress knees, they kind of create... You know, these aerial roots, they're growing in the water in very wetland areas, and they need to do some oxygen exchange. And so they'll basically create this upward growth of root that kind of sticks vertically straight out of the ground, and it, it just creates excellent, excellent habitat for crappie. But for And really excellent tripping hazards. for That too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, and there's a lot of boating accidents because of those those bald cypress knees. Now, I will say it, it's, again, one of the, the better spots to, to duck hunt, um, especially down in kind of the southern Midwest part of the, the United States. I do not necessarily recommend going down there if it's, you know, your first or your second duck hunt. There's a lot of people who've, who've hunted down there for a long time, and, and it, it's one of those cultures that, that's very specific on the way things are done. It's very um, competitive. It is extremely it? competitive. I believe, didn't a yes. couple people get shot yes. a couple years ago yes. there? And so that, that's, again, why I recommend if you are going to, to go down there, there's a ton of outfitters and guides who have private access in the area. Um, but also, um, there, there's, again, a, a lot of good people. And a lot of those stories, um, I, I know the big one that hit the headlines two or three years ago um, where a, a hunter was shot. It actually wasn't even a hunting accident. It was just somebody arguing with somebody and things got out of hand. Um, so again, that's just kind of the, the, the nature of the beast down in, in you know, the, these areas. But it's a really good spot to hunt. Just don't make sure it's, it's not your first or your second waterfall trip. That's a that's an earthquake lake, isn't it? I, I believe mean, so. Yes. Yeah, I think really. Yeah. yeah, I think yeah, it was created by an earthquake, and like the deepest part of the lake is like nine feet or it's, something. It's, it's so a shallow. Really shallow lake. Yeah, the what, whole thing is like just crappie habitat. So. Did it- Wow. When I was a kid, they used to advertise big time, at, like no limit on crappie. I don't know yeah. if there is a limit. I, now. I think there may be now. Yeah, I believe it. I mean, we have we have crappie in my HOA pond, and we were like, take them because they're, they're <laughs> prol- if, if you don't know this, crappie are prolific breeders, and they shouldn't be in a small pond, right? And they will take over. They'll stunt everything else in the pond. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, I understand that. But how was the earth? I mean, was there a river that there was a real next to river it? there? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, that's pretty neat. It, it's a it's a real interesting area, and if you just kind of drive around, even if you don't hunt, or, or I highly recommend fishing uh, for certain. It is just a blast to catch a bunch of crappie down there. But they have just a, a ton of historical buildings and a lot of cultural type events that teach you know the history of the area that show what a lot of the loggers in the area used to use these bald cypress trees for. And there's just a real cultural impact, and I think it it really transcends that that local community and, and really expands it uh, to to be quite quite more and it, it it's a really cool 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 area so definitely an area worth worth looking into and especially even if you're into bird watching 
I saw, I probably added 30 or 40 birds to, to my life list when I first made a, a trip down to Real Foot Lake. There's ducks that you don't normally see. Um, you see a ton of ruddy ducks down there, um, which, which we normally don't see too many in Illinois, especially during hunting season, um, obviously. But a lot, of, a lot of cool stuff to see down there. Anyone else have any out-of-state type of trips you guys been on before or would recommend? Uh, yeah. While, while, we're, oh, while we're talking about waterfowl, got to throw out uh, Nebraska – um, cause I, I did take a waterfowl hunting trip there last year and yeah, Nebraska is right in basically the honey hole of ducks right now. Uh, back when I was a kid, it used to be Arkansas, right? Everybody always wanted to duck hunt Arkansas, but as more and more, uh, basically waterfowl habitat was constructed up North along the same time when maybe winters are getting more and more mild, a lot of the ducks don't even get to Arkansas anymore. And so now I would argue that really the hot spot is, is Missouri or Nebraska. And Nebraska has this uh, wonderful, in the central portion of Nebraska, is called the Rainwater Basin. Mm. And um, I don't even know the number of public land sites, but they are numerous. You could literally hunt another public land site for pheasant and duck every day for I think about the whole season and probably (laughs) just keep going. I mean, me and my brother scouted um, like 12 or 14 places in one day, Mm -hmm. just driving around a circle. And uh, yeah, so just an amazing amount of public hunting opportunities. And this is if uh, the water is high. So on a dry year, there's not a whole lot of habitat to hunt in the rainwater basins. You want to stay away from there. Just like the name says, they do, uh, they rely on rainwater. They don't have underground pumps to supplement that so uh, if the water is high a ton of habitat for hunters and uh, the the licenses are not that bad if you want to get a annual hunting license in Nebraska 109 bucks for the whole year they also offer a two-day option that's that's 76 bucks you also do have to buy a habitat stamp for both ducks and pheasants which is 25 bucks and then a $10 uh, state waterfowl stamp. Of course, you need the federal stamp that you need for any state in there, too. Um, And then HIP certification, which is free, but you need that for any migratory birds. But relatively cheap, a ton of public land. Most of it is just open, first come, first serve. So you just go out there, find a place, and go hunt. Um, And a ton of pheasants, too. So you can do easily, we, we shot ducks and pheasants, you can easily double up, especially if you have a dog, a lab, or something with you. Mm-hmm. Um, in the same hunt, you can go try to get your limit of ducks, and then on your walk out, try to shoot a handful of pheasants too. So really, really nice place to go with a ton of public land options. Uh, tags are not that expensive, and a ton of ducks, you know, way, especially in the early season. They've got way more ducks than we've got here in yeah. Illinois, so... Mm-hmm. Uh, if you if you like to see birds in the sky and fire your gun, I, I highly recommend it. <laughs> nice. So what, what time of year would you consider early season? Well, I went there last year, the very first part of November. So I think it was like November 2nd to the 6th or something sure. like that. But, yeah, I would basically, and me being growing up as a Missouri duck hunter, I consider basically Thanksgiving as being the peak. Mm-hmm. Okay, so that's what the old timers would call the Grand Passage, the time when hundreds of thousands of mallards are coming through so anything before thanksgiving i consider early season anything after thanksgiving i consider late season but that's just me cool well i've kind of got one more i want to highlight kind of following along the the same trends especially when we're we're thinking kind of upland hunting anyone done much quail hunting i know i've, I've done a little bit not a, a huge unfortunately have never seen a quail yet in my life never seen a quail well i've got the spot for you adam <laughs> yeah. i've shot a few in missouri but no, i've, I've seen coveys in missouri yeah I was, I was on a dirt road and they were all over the place in the one spot i was at it was awesome sure they're they're one of the, the coolest birds especially mm-hmm. and and you kind of mentioned a term that that most people aren't familiar with but have probably heard and that's covey I mean, the quail are kind of a, a cool bird because, you know, especially during the, the winter, they group up in these groups that, you know, sometimes can be 12 birds, some kind, sometimes can be three dozen. I um, mean, we just kind of term that that a covey. But the, the, the kind of area and I want to highlight is, again, back in Kentucky. I did a, a lot of hunting through college in Kentucky. Um, but it, it's quail hunting. There's, there's a really good um, population of quail. Obviously, here in Illinois, in the southern part of the state, you can, you know, occasionally find find a property that's got a covey or two um, that, that's kind of holding strong on that property but for the most part 
especially up where we are in the kind of the, the mid portion of the state. We don't really get quail. We're a little too far north. Um, but, but one area I want to highlight is the, the Peabody um, Wildlife Management Area. It, it's in Muhlenberg County in Kentucky. Anyone ever heard of the musician John Prine? Yes. Oh, yeah. He's actually got a song about Peabody WMA. WMA, I think it's called Paradise is the, the name of the song, but he sings about the Peabody coal mine in cool. Muhlenberg County. Um, and so that's this area. It's actually a, a reclaimed coal mine um, that I think was re- reclaimed in the mid-1980s. Um, but they've done kind of a unique study. They have one part of the property they've left to what was prescribed in that reclamation project, and the other they're doing active habitat management. So one half is kind of their their experiment and one is obviously their control and on this control historically in this you know reclamation act that that these you know people had to follow they allowed Ceresia lespedeza to be you know used as as a cover crop to basically be planted in these areas obviously that's a highly invasive plant it basically takes over everything and so the the control is basically just solid Ceresia lespedeza you'll occasionally find a few quail using those areas but if you get over to the experimental side you can find coveys you know 30 40 strong and i know just a, a few times hunting there i've kicked up you know three to, to four coveys back to back to back all with a, a couple dozen birds that you'll see fly take off land in another direction and and there's just a, a really abundant population there and i know they do do some banding so if you ever thought about trying to get a banded quail might be one of one of your best opportunities i don't know how recent that that project is um i actually worked there in 2015 so it's been some time but but there's probably still a few quail around there that that have some bands on them now, too many things in hunting more exciting than jumping a covey. Of it, it is exciting. You're just yeah. walking along in the woods, and all of a sudden, you just hear that noise that's unmistakable. Yes. And oh my gosh! And the, and I find the hardest part, and honestly, it's probably evolutionarily, it's probably why coveys exist. It is very hard to pinpoint one specific bird out of a covey to take that shot on. You know, when they flush up, you just see this flash of wings, and then by the time you think, they're all gone. <laughs> it's pretty wild. Shooting. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's I need to experience terrible. that. That's on the bucket list. Peabody WMA in Muhlenberg <laughs> County. John you can Brown. you can listen to the song the whole way that's there. Right. Yeah. <laughs> oh man. Uh, so another one that I'd like to talk about, and Dan and I have talked about doing this for a couple of years now, but uh, black bear hunting in Pennsylvania. So it's hard to get black bear tags in some states. I know Michigan. I mean, you're looking at years of getting points if you're out of state trying to get up in Michigan. But in Pennsylvania, where the population is pretty decent, and you got you do have a chance of getting a black bear, mm-hmm. it's over the counter tags, mm-hmm. right? So over the counter tags, no points needed. You just go there as an out of state person, purchase tags, and head out and try to find yourself a black bear. I don't know anywhere else that uh, that close to us anyway that you're going to be able to do that. So um, no, I know Wisconsin has a, a black bear season, and I think a couple of the zones you need only like one to two points. Zone C, yeah, yeah. which is sitters only. Yeah. You can get with just a couple points, but I think certainly just, not over the counter. Yeah, I think they just redrew the zone, so there's more of them they now. Did, yeah, and uh, I think more of them require more points than like I think it's like five plus. I mm-hmm. think some of them are nine plus. So that's one point a year. So it's going to take you a while to to go black bear hunting in, in a state like Wisconsin. I'm sure Michigan's yeah. similar to that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, especially if you want to get uh, the places in Wisconsin that require the most points or the places that allow um, hunting with hounds, yeah, yeah. which is a unique hunting experience with bear, and the mm-hmm. success rate is a lot higher. So, yeah, those take a lot more points than the, the sitters only, which when I say that, that means they are not allowed to use hounds. They mm-hmm. Uh, can just sit over bait. And I, mm-hmm. If memory serves, I think their success rate is under 30%. Mm-hmm. Wow. And then the hound hunters, it's more like 60%. So it, it kind of doubles your your odds to, to yeah. be able to hunt with hounds. Yeah. And now the, the real cool thing about Pennsylvania, um, especially, I, I, I don't know if you've you know looked too much at the maps. Obviously you have Jason, you, you grew up there, but they have so much public land. Yeah. I mean, it is just insane the amount of public land they have and and the real cool thing is if you go and buy a non-resident hunting license you're spending a hundred dollars right for a non-resident hunting license what are you getting with that you're getting one antler deer tag one fall turkey tag one spring turkey tag and one small game hunting license for that year all for a hundred dollars no and if you want to throw in a bear hunt like jason said that add-on for a non-resident bear license what would you guess the price is 
I would guess five dollars. It's thirty, but <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I had no idea. It's like thirty-four, but again, okay. for one hundred thirty-four dollars, you're getting a non-resident tag for an antlered deer, so a buck, um, fall turkey, spring turkey, your small game license, and a bear license, all for about one hundred forty bucks. I mean, you can't go to the grocery store these days without <laughs> yeah. spending a hundred bucks for a bag of groceries, two yeah. bags. So, like, that's pretty. Just good deal. for perspective, yeah. if you wanted to buy a any deer uh, license for like Kansas, which mm-hmm. my my brother and dad do, it, it's like it's almost five hundred yeah, bucks like just for the deer license. Bucks or something. Like I think, yeah, yeah, I think it's four sixty. Yeah. yeah, somewhere in there. Yeah, wow. man. Yeah, I think uh, Pennsylvania is about sixteen percent public land. That's amazing. Sixteen yeah, percent. Put that in perspective. East, for an eastern yeah. state, that's yeah. insane. I mean, what Illinois is two, right? Two. Yeah. yeah. So you're looking at sixteen at a state that's it's comparable in size of Illinois. Mm-hmm. I mean, Illinois is pretty big, but um, it's a ton of public land, and and the public land is where the bears are too. Yep. Up yep. in the middle of the, of the state, where there's a lot of mountains and things like that. So uh, definitely something to check out. Yeah, and if you're interested, you know, you can go on the the pretty much any of these, you know, state. DNR, whatever their their DNR agency is is kind of titled, whatever their website is. Historically, a lot of times they'll have harvest reports for these different public sites or for the counties, and you can really get a good idea just again scouting from the comfort of your home, own home, at least a, a starting place. Maybe it's not you know your final place, but at least it kind of gets you in that that right mindset and at least gets you right on the on the right path. All right. Well, does anyone else have any other uh, trip ideas they have? Sure, I'll go uh, talk about Wisconsin, uh, which is our neighbor to the north here in Illinois. I grew up in uh, the suburbs of Chicago, so I did a lot of my hunting when I was young in Wisconsin just because it was a lot closer for me. Uh, And I was lucky enough to know somebody with some private land. And I'll dive into my favorite species to hunt, of course, is turkey. I've mentioned that in many podcasts before. Um, And a non-resident turkey license in Wisconsin is right around 60 to 70 bucks. Um, there's plenty of public land opportunity right over the border, so I know we get a lot of questions from people who live in the Chicagoland area, and we get a lot of participants from there, so keep that in mind. They have a pretty long uh, turkey season, too. They have uh, six seasons compared to how we only have five seasons, uh, so it's even extended a little bit longer. So if you do happen to shoot a turkey in Illinois and still have the itch, you can head up to Wisconsin for the last season that they have. And uh, I'll mention the deer hunting there is also pretty good. Obviously, CWD is an issue, so be cautious of that. But uh, non-resident deer license is around 160 bucks uh, for firearm and then archery as well. So you've got to obviously have separate tags there. But you do have the opportunity to rifle hunt uh, in that state. So uh, just something to keep in mind as well. And I know, Curtis, you've been up there for woodcock hunting, right? Oh, yeah. If you're talking about, <clears throat> that's my favorite thing for Wisconsin is woodcock and grouse hunting. Like me being a bird hunter, you know, focusing on waterfowl and every once in a while getting to shoot like pheasants and quail, that's a really cool experience, getting to hunt upland birds in the deep forest. Like the first time I did it, I had no idea what to expect. And uh, northern Wisconsin is just covered in public land. I mean, there's mm-hmm. like the Chequamegon National uh, Forest and a couple big national forests up there that are literally like 100,000 acres. So, wow. I mean, you can hunt. Jeez. Like, we could go up there and drive around all day and hunt public land and not even see a corner of it. I mean, it, it's, it's, it's crazy. But it, So, grouse are cyclical you got to hit them on the right, on the high cycle. If you hit them on the high cycle, the hunting is absolutely world-class. And then woodcock are migratory, so you got to hit those right. But if you get in there when it's right, when the grouse cycle's high... Do you mean the the population cycle? Yeah. Like like It's like predator-prey kind of? It is, yep. So when you think about, like, the lynx and the snowshoe hare, boom, bust... So, um, uh, and uh, I'm not sure exactly what drives that cyclical nature, mm-hmm. but grouse apparently are very, very cyclical like huh. that. Like I know being a fur bearer guy, Martin are like that. They're cyclical basically with the, um, the population of the micro teens. So, the, you know, the boom bust cycle. But grouse are that same way. You get them on a high cycle, catch the woodcock right, and it's, it's basically upland hunting that is, uh, South Dakota times five, to be honest with you, because 
But when you pheasant hunt and quail hunt, you cover some ground. Mm -hmm. When you're hunting in the woods, you cover a very small amount of ground. And when I went up there the first time, I feel like we covered an acre and we put up like 20 woodcock (laughs) and like six grouse. And I had more shooting in that one little like hour long hunt than I had in maybe my previous 20 hours of upland hunting Mm -hmm. pheasants and quail. Wow. I, I mean, just absolutely insane. Now, it's super hard to get a shot I was, because I was you're not walking that. in the grass. Dude, I can't hit a pheasant in an open field. <laughs> oh. How am I supposed to hit a woodcock and a, a, a baseball going between trees? Well, in the, the real cool <laughs> way is the, the way that they actually manage the habitat for rough gr- or for grouse. They're they're very reliant on different successional stages of forest, and so a lot of times they'll do a strip where they you know almost clear cut it. Then right across in the next three years, they'll clear cut that. And so you have this rotation of very thick to somewhat thick. to. And if you're in that very thick or somewhat thick, it can be darn near impossible to get up a shot. I'll be in the open area, and you guys can walk around, and I'll just wait it out, all right? Make sure you guys have bells on, all right? We could throw in a quick plug for the IDNR Wing Shooting Clinic. Jason, there's one coming up at Middle Fork. Uh, I'm out of town. I know. Uh, i got to go. Well, there's there's a few more. you got to do one in the woods. I know. Well, <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's a whole different thing. It's a start, at least. It is a start. No, I definitely need a clinic to help my shooting when it comes to pheasants anyway. Clay's I can hit fine. Pheasants, I, I get scared when they jump up, all right? It's like my reaction time. It's like, ah! oh, so there he goes. keep your eyes open. I know. I, mean, I don't, don't get me started on trying to shoot a covey. Jeez Louise. I'll tell you, the folks up there in northern Wisconsin, they're not shy about shooting grouse off the ground or in the tree. I, when I, my first, like I had never shot a grouse before, and there was one walking in front of me, and I didn't shoot it, and those, I still haven't forgotten about those. Every time I talk to those guys up there, they tell me about that grouse I didn't shoot. Like, I didn't want to shoot my first one off the ground, mm-hmm. and yeah, they, they, they gave me a hard time for that, so... Um, yeah, every everything in the grouse and woodcock uh, woods is is fair game. If you see one of those birds, it's su- it's such tough shooting that I understand it. Mm-hmm. So if you see one sitting on a limb, just go ahead and blast it and pat yourself on the back. I can I see that. It. Yeah, that's interesting how your ethics can change depending on how difficult the task is, huh? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so, yeah, anything else, guys? Yeah, I think one one thing I'd just like to, to bring up, especially, you know, because we're kind of talking about some of the more economic, you know, type types of, of non-resident hunting. If, if you do go out of state, be very specific and very careful and read through the regulations about transporting game across state lines. That's a good um, point. Especially, you know, if you're thinking of, of deer hunting in, in, in another state, there are very specific regulations about what you can bring back across state lines and what you cannot. And um, time frame. And well. time frame, exactly. And so there, there's some nuances that, that you'll need to do some research. Um, it's certainly not, not anything I would just immediately get up and go, mm-hmm. um, especially for, uh, you know, a, a first time. But but certainly some, some research can, can certainly help clarify. And we'd be happy to help answer answer any questions about, you know, transporting game across state lines. As, and, of as course, we can. always feel free to call that state's fish and game mm-hmm. model, our agency. Mm-hmm. I'm sure they'll be. And with birds as well, you know, a lot of times until you get back to your house, you do have to keep a fully feathered wing and the head so that they can not only identify the species but the sex because in waterfowl, uh, some of the limits are, are not only dictated by the species but also the sex as in the case with mallards. So, um, yeah, definitely check those out before you're hauling game across state lines because now it becomes... Uh, violation above a normal wildlife violation. A lacy. Mm-hmm. Yeah, now it's a Lacey Act violation, which is crossing state lines. So don't want to do that. No, no. I, I forgive me if, if this goes off wrong, but I, we we were talking to some gentleman who was talking about how he was hunting somewhere and he couldn't fit his birds in the cooler and he didn't know how to get them back. And then you told him a tip to how to pack a bird in a cooler correctly so that way you could get them oh, back. Oh, I just more told back. him to put, that put was? the legs inside the cavity of the breast because he, he said he breasted them out and he didn't have room for the legs. And I was thinking, there's enough room in the cavity for the legs. Uh, yeah, <laughs> just stuff them right so, in where you yeah, pull yeah, the innards. Yeah. So yeah. just like you'd have like a stuffed turkey for yeah. Thanksgiving, you just take the legs out, just put it in the cavity, and then you're good to go. Yeah, he's yeah. Like, and he, he was very surprised and perplexed by that. He's like, I didn't even think of that. Yeah. But I remember he was talking to us at... I think that was, was at snow the, geese. And yeah. yeah, with snow geese, I can see where storage could be an issue because no limit in the spring. Mm-hmm. So 
you bring your your cooler and all of a sudden you've got 45 geese to fit in there. <laughs> yeah. That could be pretty tough. And that always goes back to Chuck Stites. I, I think about that all the time. When you're harvesting these animals, have a plan to get the meat back. You put all this time and money into getting out yeah. to where you can get them. Sure. Don't shoot more than you can't fit in your dang cooler, bud. Yep. Yeah. Prepare know? for the hunt. Prepare for the harvest. Exactly. Yep. I sure. love it. Be prepared to be unsuccessful, but also be prepared to be very successful. <laughs> yeah. You know? Yep. Yeah. Like, you yeah, never you know which both. way it'll go. Absolutely. No. Well, all right, guys. Well, that was a fun conversation, and I think we even have more ideas, but we got cut this off here. But, um, yeah, so those were kind of just some out-of-state hunts that we've either thought about going on or have experience with that aren't breaking the bank, really, when you think about it, compared to some other out-of-state stuff you can go do. But, uh, I don't know, maybe next time we can talk about going to Hawaii and shooting some Axis deer or something like that. That's some <laughs> good out-of-state hunting. But, uh, all right, so with that, we'll see you next time uh, on the next next episode there. So thanks a lot for listening, and we'll see you around. <laughs>